Good evening, everybody, and welcome to tonight's stream. We have with us Chris Carson. Hey, Chris, thank you for joining us. And he has accepted a challenge tonight. And boy, what a challenge that is. A uh, procedurally generated map in Fusion 2.5. Chris, how you doing? Why don't you say hi real quick? Hello, real quick. Excellent. Thank you for that mic check for me. <laughs> hey, before you know, before we get going, you know how it is. I've got to run my mouth just a little bit. Uh, if you tuned in, you got to see our live Patreon commercial. We, the Georgia Game Developers Association is a nonprofit organization, so please support our Patreon. Your support will help us with efforts to improve game developers and their community, as well as helping to bring better games to life. And I will learn to talk here in just a moment. Our stream is for uh, gamers looking to learn more about what goes into making their favorite games, and it's for new designers looking to break into the industry. And it's for experienced designers, like Chris, looking to improve their skills, like making a procedurally generated map in an hour or just over a roundabouts. <laughs> Certain levels of our Patreon members will get access to join our live stream in vocal chat. Isn't that right, Andrew? He's not going to talk to us. Okay. Andrew? Oh, yeah. Hey, hey, hey. There we all go. Right, I thought you were trying to put the next <laughs> thing into chat. All right. That's all good. All right, so uh, as you see, we got a third member joining us in vocal chat who can pipe in at any moment. That's a certain level of our Patreon members can have access to that as we do uh, first looks and all kinds of neat stuff. All right, uh, next up, you see this awesome looking powerful shirt? That's right, it gives me a lot more HP. Our coffee cups will give you more intellect. All you gotta do is go to cafepress.com forward slash GGDA, go out and buy something right now. That's not a request. All right, um, our YouTube channel. Everything that we stream here, um, we end up uploading permanently to our YouTube channel. So please be sure to go check out and follow our YouTube channel. And finally, the GGDA holiday party is December 12th. Woo! At Tripwire Interactive new offices. Whoa. All right. If you know of Tripwire Interactive, we are talking Killing Floor, Killing Floor 2, Rising Storm. Ah, there's so many killer games. Uh, so join us for fellowship, fun, and festive Zed slaying. So, and also be sure if you like games and if you're interested in game development, uh, click that little follow button right here on the Mixer channel and our YouTube channel and tune in. All right. Say short, sweet, to the point. Chris, you ready to take over? Ready to take on a challenge of making a procedurally generated map within one hour or okay. thereabouts. All right. So we're going to start uh, doing this in a couple segments. My screen. Here we go. Just a press. And should be shared. Does everyone see the screen? I am seeing the screen. Here we go. Corlex says, I seize it. Infinity. So here's a Fusion. I've uh, preset an application up uh, for the uh, demonstration. A lot. I set my application width and height uh, to 1136 by 640. The frame also shares the same dimensions. And I dropped a quick backdrop in, which we're going to expand out. So the first map we're going to make is we're going to make kind of a, a, a star system map, procedurally generated star system. Uh, that'll be our base, and if we have time, we'll try to do something a little more uh, in intricate with walls and stuff. So the very first thing we need to do in procedural generation, at least in my experience of procedural generation, is we need to get some numbers. That's right, numbers. And um, we're going to use, we'll go 64 by 64 size planets for this map. So let me just draw a single planet real quick. Do, do, do. There we go. We go ahead and paint our little world here. A happy world. Remember, it's your it's your it's your universe. Have fun. And when you're done, talk to squirrels in your backyard. There we go. And we should name it. Planets. And yeah, there's a reason why I said planets. We're going to use the same object for all the planets. Uh, and then uh, I think we're good here. We don't want to create it at start. So yes, I said we got we to gotta generate numbers first. So we know that the height of our screen 
is uh, 640 divided by uh, 64 is 10. And 11.36 divided by 64 and 75, so we'll say 17. So we've got 17 and 10 to work with. Okay, so first list we'll call second list we'll call vertical. I got a capital V because we made a capital A H. Got a trusty event editor. So I'm going to call a start of frame. Those numbers as soon as we start. And I'll call two fast loops. I'm going to start loop one that says generate horizontal. Copy that. So we won't need 100 of the numbers, but let's just generate 100. And then on loop, we have generate horizontal. Another fast loop, fast loop in programming parlance would be a subroutine. Vertical. We will also do that 100 times. And we'll create an on loop. Vertical. So we have our horizontal and vertical list box. And then you'll see here I've added an object called randomizer. Randomizer. So what randomizer does, it lets us set a seed value. So we'll set a random seed, and we'll just say 100 to start. 101. OK. And then we go ahead, and we're going to add a line. Then we're going to create a string, because we're entering, entering text, but we're actually going to pull numbers. So we need to do the string conversion. And say, give me a random number in a range. So the initial number would be 0. And because this is horizontal, let's run it and see what we get. And now we get a list all between a range. And they're randomly generated based on the seed value. Over and over, you see that I'm getting different numbers, which is not supposed to happen. And the reason why that's happening is because um, Fusion is still running, and so it's still accessing the same seed base and appending different numbers. So that was a poor demonstration. So if I run it again, we'll screenshot our numbers. We'll put that bad boy over here, and then we'll turn it off, run it again, have the same numbers. And for some reason, we don't. This, and this is what I love about programming. I don't know what care. I don't care what you're programming in. I don't care who you are. Um, programming is uh, the first half is coming up with this incredible, amazing stuff, and then the last half is fixing everything you broke, <laughs> which is uh, what I just did. I set my random seed after I generated the numbers. If you don't input a number into the number generator seed before you generate numbers, it randomly generates numbers on its own. So if I run it now should have every time I run it. This is important when uh, doing uh, and there we go, identical numbers. Because uh, worlds, planets, systems, maps, whatever, just on a seed number which is uh, pretty cool because then you can remember and always load the new map and it will always be the same map, uh, if that makes sense. So let's see if uh, at this point we have any questions so I don't repeat it over and over again. Uh, game programming is always about making computers do something no one else has. Oh, okay. Yeah, that too. All right, now we got to do the same thing with our generate vertical numbers. So I'm going to just drag the event over, but the range is different for 10. So as uh, vertically, it's uh, 640. There's only 10 spots. A 64 by 64 bits uh, pixel sprite could fit, and we don't want we don't want any of them overlapping. So the next fast loop will uh, run is. Minutes. 
you know, well, let's start with just 10 planets. See where that gets us. Eighth planet. Now what we'll do is we will create planets. And we're going to put it uh, off screen, rather. So we'll just put it here. It's 64 get negative 64 by negative 64 so it does not appear popping in under the screen we want it to immediately drop where it's going to go and we do that here coordinate and we know it's 64 pixels so we got to multiply 64 and we start with the horizontal because that's what x is and we get line but i got to convert that line into a value and the line number will be the loop index that we're on. Loop indexes in Fusion are zero-based. List object is zero-based, and I think they now default to uh, one-based. I need to add a one. Let's see what that does. And that may simply be because we haven't uh, placed them at X. I mean, we placed them at X, so they're appearing at the top. They're, they're appearing up here in a random exposition. But because we started creating them here, depth. So that's the next line, which is not that hard. Position, set Y position. And just like before, 64 times we're going to get line. The line is loop index, make planet, plus one. Now we get planets. And every time we run it, we get the same system of planets. Do extra, right? Um, we could start by creating different types of planets. So let's say we have, we'll give each planet different colors. Green planets, yellow planets, deep blue planets. This with the lighter blue planets. Magenta planet are no joke. And all the tax auditors live on the gray planet. <laughs> Of planets, and when I said we have seven planets. Please tell me images... you can blow up that planet. Sorry. <laughs> oh, this one? You want to blow this one up? Yeah. <laughs> so images uh, in Fusion, in an animation in an active object, are zero-based. So even though it says frame one, this is actually frame zero. So let's remember that it's zero-based. One, two, three, four, five, and six. Now, when we generated our numbers, you'll notice that zeros were included. Zero to a max of 16, I believe, on this one, and a max of 9 on this one. Which is 0 through 6. So what we need a new fast loop, planet type, I we make the appropriate fast loop, planet type, and again, we can do 100. It's a pool of numbers that we're putting in a, in a list object. We will rename this one to planet type. Planet tile. There we go. Just like before, generate this time it'll be from 0 to 7, a 0 to 6 number. So let's make sure that it, in fact, does that. We get 0 to 6. So on this planet that we created, now we're going to go to animation, change, animation frame. We're going to line. Then we're going to 
which iteration. And we're going to call that make planet. I forgot my quotations. And we plus one it. And of course, it says still syntax error or numeric expression because this is text based. We have to convert it to a value. Should that have been done right? An error. And the error is I made my planets before I generated my planet type. In Fusion, if you want to see what the main loop looks uh, like, you can look at it with this view here, the event list editor view. And you can see that here are my main line numbers. And then the conditions or the ifs are, and it operates in order. And before I generate planet type, then yes, all the planets are going to be zero or the blue color. So by switching it that way, we should have it debug, run it, planets. And every time I run it, I get those different planets. Now, we can add a see how the seed value works a little better. So edit, right. We'll drop that edit box here. Tests. We're going to hide them. Put them off screen, get them out of our way. B for button. Come on. There you are. Right. Generate. do now is we will say we're going to destroy all the planets. We're going to reset the lists. Change the random seed to a value of whatever number has been typed into here. Execute all our fast loops. We'll look at the order to make sure we did it right. Looks good. And so it starts with 100, and then I can type in 999 world. Now, it didn't seem to destroy the planets for some reason. Let's confirm that. Simply by deactivating this line. It's not clearing out the previous planets for some reason. So it could be just a tricky thing in Fusion. Because I'm calling fast loops, it may not catch the destroy. So let's see if that worked. There you go. Created very basic procedural generation based on a seed value. I guess to do that, 18 minutes, not bad. So let's see if anybody has any comments for me. Little world, yes, that no, I do appreciate a happy little world. Uh, okay, and he's going to make sure I get the questions, and apparently we've had none. There was one that said, if we're going to generate them for X, Y, and Z, can we also generate their position in time? Um, I mean, you could, yeah. So I guess the question is, what does he mean by in time? If, we're, if you're doing, do you want them to appear at specific times, or do you want them to, you know what I mean? What, what is that, what, what do we mean by time? I'm guessing he's probably meaning like uh, randomly appearing uh, within a time frame, or unless he... <laughs> here you go, here he right. is. So it started as uh, me thinking about it. We could generate them on the x, y, Hello? and z axis. We could also then generate them on the fourth dimension, and if we did that, we would have them coming in and out of existence. Oh, well, yes, maybe. Could you hear us? I didn't hear anything. <laughs> oh, okay. Whoops. Test, test, test. Test, test, test. Do you not hear Andrew? 
Test, test, test. Hello. Yay, technical difficulties. All right, let's step back. Um, uh, Chris, can you hear me? All righty. All right, we may have lost some vocal communications somehow. <laughs> Chris, are you still with us? Can you hear yes, me? Yes, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Could you hear Andrew when he was talking? No. Try it one more time, Andrew. Hello, hello. So my comment uh, began with kind of a goofy thought that if we could generate a world uh, X, Y, and Z's coordinates. Nothing coming over here. All right. He cannot hear you for some reason. That is kind of crazy, even though we're all in the same voice channel. Uh, well, anyways, let's just keep uh, tooling away. Maybe type out your comment, Andrew. And he can keep on going. So I'm going to do some comments here. Yes. And then we, we still could copying this event, dropping it here, to start a frame, and setting the randomizer to a specific value. We could go back to generating an initial system. Generate. Another thing you could do is by using ASCII, you could convert text from ASCII into values, to be the seed value, which is really cool if you wanted to, you know, have someone travel to Andrew's system, and then, you know, the player could type in, well, you visit this system, and, and then that system set up a certain way. And, of course, we're doing very basic procedural generation here, but you could make it as complex as you want. One thing I want to do is I did drop an array file here, and I figured we could save the data while we're at it. And the way we're going to do that, knowing that we have a 17 by 10 dimension array, I'm going to, the solar system, I'm going to create a 17 by 10 dimension array. The ways arrays work in fusion is um, they only work in the positive. You can't have negative x position or negative y position. Um, but if I was to start writing to position 18 on the x, as you can see, there is no uh, 18 I, it limits to 17. It will automatically expand. Uh, if you have a 3D array, meaning that you have several slices down, and you expand a slice down, it will expand all the rest of the slices. So you can always ex push out the array. You just can't go into the negatives, um, which is why when I did uh, Bit Odyssey, um, I wanted to make the, the procedural generation endless. I wanted you to be able to explore endless amount of stars. So uh, what I did there is I created a um, deep array, and each layer of the array represented a quadrant. And if you were in your map position, which I stored in a different uh, storage object, in the negatives, uh, either x or y, or both x and y, it would then switch you to one of those four arrays, and using absolute values, switch them back to positives, and allowed me to push out further. So what we're going to do is we're going to store all the data that we create in our planet, which we need planet type for value. I keep typing tile. What is my deal? Gotta that's like, love dyslexic that's like Stephen with an H. <laughs> uh, just to Stephen clarify with, with you, if you can hear me, can you hear me? Oh. Hey, Chris, could you hear me real quick? Yes. Hey, all right. Uh, just to clarify what Andrew was talking about, he said his he said uh, his thought was that if we could generate the world's x y z coordinates, we could also generate its coordinates on the fourth dimension, being time, and uh, and have planets come into and out of existence. This would be an inter This would be interesting for a millennia spanning game like Spawn. Yeah, I mean, you could do that. You would have to now. In Fusion, we're spawning the the objects at the beginning of the game. So you would have to either spawn them at the beginning of the game, and then if you're making a 2D game, hide the sprite until the stored timer time 
triggers when it's supposed to appear and when it's supposed to disappear, and then make it vanish again. So yeah, I mean, you could do that. Or you could write uh, a less effective routine, which would uh, uh, create the time and random times in and out, and then have to scan consistently your array to see which ones match the uh, current time to create. I think doing it the other way around would be better because then you're not consistently pinging a data source. Objects outside of your application, doesn't matter what you're in, it you know starts to tax your resources. And writing any program on any system with any language, you want to manage your resources as best as possible. So that being said, I was actually creating some create in our uh, planets. Next one I'm going to create is so we got population planet type. Give me a give me a, a third value that we might want to. Anybody? Nine. Nine is in no. That uh, material. Korlek. Material. Corlex says material. Okay. Material. So we got material type. We got planet type, population, and material type. Now, what we're going to try to do is we're going to try to generate when we make planet the additional values that we need by using the same command when we generated our lists. We'll copy the random range expression, and then on our create planet line, we're going to go on the fast loop. We're going to go to where is it? Ultra values set random range. We'll say a thousand to. 9,000. And then we could do the same thing with material type. Materials 0 to 4. What we do to test to make sure that works correctly is we're going to grab a string that we'll use for texting, for testing rather. Drop it here. Black is obviously not a good color choice. Stretch that bad boy out. Then we're going to add a testing condition that says over an object, and that object being one of our instances of a planet, then please pull data from it. And the data we want, relation, and we'll separate it. And we also want to pull the material type number. So planets, material type, Population and material type, and then we run it. Didn't work. Oh, that's because it's click. I wanted it over. Check for mouse over an object. There you go. So that's in three, two. Of course, the population should be a number in the thousands, so we need to figure out where we went wrong there. And there's the bug. I'm setting the population again to the smaller number when it was supposed to be material type. Programming. X you made. There we go. So we can see that the red planet on this seed, 1,147 uh, population. Let's rerun it. Same population. Let's add a different seed. Let's check out the purple planet, 5,513. 5,013. Change the number. Got a purple planet over here with a totally different uh, population. So now, with procedural generation and a random number generator, we're actually creating content. OK, now we need to store that data, right? So let's create our save routine. Go to comment the data. We know that we generated X number of planets on the map, which should be a total of 10. And what we're going to do is we're going to say on the keyboard, when pressing S for save, we're going to run a fast loop, 
save my with a Z. And we're going to run that based on the number of planets we generated. So we're going to create that first loop on fast loop, planets with a Z. And we're going to identify one planet. We're going to pick one at random. We're going to write value. We're going to write a rather string to x, y. Okay, and the string we're going to write is we're going to write a string the population. Then we need a delimiter. And then we're going to do string material type. We also need string animation current frame. So whatever frame it's been locked in on. So the data that we're going to store in the cell is the current frame it's being forced to, which is the planet type. Then we're going to have a delimiter, and then the population number, and another delimiter, and the material type, we hit OK. Where are we storing it? Position, an XY position for the object. So we should be able to say, give me the X position of the planet. And because we multiplied it by 64, divided it by 64 to get a value between 0 and 17 for X. And we'll do the same thing for y. We did it right, uh, the proper data in our uh, array object. And after we're done, we need to save the array. So let's uh, file, I'll use an expression, and we'll just say my planets array. R, R. Now, the problem with that is it doesn't tell me exactly where to put it, so I'm going to use expression here, which locates the root directory of the app or wherever it's running. Looking good. And then we need to destroy the planet that we're reading. That way we only pick that planet once. So I need to save this. So we'll create a new folder temporarily here. And we'll call it procedural procedure, procedural generation. Dump it in there. Application two, that's fine. And then I need to find that folder. Motions, fusion wars. And so there's no array file here. We run it. Generated our world with our data. We hit I believe it was the S key. Yep. It wrote the data, and let's see if we have a file. And there we go, we have an array file. Have to load the data. So instead of generating one of those random worlds, we're gonna we're gonna add load the data. Let's start a frame. Drop that between here. We're going to first load file, which the best way to do it is to copy here. There. We're going to file, load array from file, use that expression, location. So we're loading and saving to the same location. Then we know that we're going to have a maximum of 17, our x, and 10y. So we're going to do a nested loop, and we're going to say fast loop, load x planets, do that 17 times. Next one has a question. Did someone has a question, or was that, was that someone having a question? Uh, no, GGDA asked at one point how many Doom stars in orbit over each, but <laughs> you're moving right along just fine. All right. 
what did I do with my starter frame? There it is. So, X planets Z, which will load our columns, if you will. And then every time we run that, we need to run Y. Oop. And it's load planets. Load Y planets. And that's where the nested loop comes in. We do that each time 10 times. Things is when these loops uh, execute, first 17 times, and the first time it runs, it pauses and runs the next loop down, which is the Y planets, which execute 10 times, and then we go back up to. Great. So loading data, we're going to create an object on the load planet Z. It's going to be our planet again. Probably just steal that event, change it, and then we got to change the data here. So instead of setting X position to the formula from our uh, data pool from uh, read value from XY. No, it would be. Mind you, I'm doing this, I'm thinking about this as we do it. So if I pause, it, it, it very well could be because I'm stupid, but it's because I'm thinking. I don't think you're stupid. Far okay, from so it. <laughs> 64, and then we go here. A x coordinates to the loop and we need to get the fast loop which is load x planets okay. that gives us our x coordinate and then we're going to set Y position, but to Y. Now, there's an issue with this. That issue is, what if there's no planet on that cell? I'm going to create a ton of planets no matter what I do. We need them to create the planets at the proper cell numbers. So there is a solution to that, and that's where our friend the string parser comes in again. So. I'm going to do that'll work. I'm going to set source string to my position. And we'll use those fast loops again. And there, no. So XY load X planets. Let's copy that. Y there we go so now we're asking how many X uh, we're, a we're asking the string parser to load the data that's in that cell in here and we say compare two general values we get number of elements elements, is it greater than one? A array, when it when, when an array reads null data into a string parser, it will return at least one element, because elements are the data between the parser. If there's no parser, it defaults to one element. So we want to say it's greater than one. Oh, if that worked correctly, it didn't. <laughs> We're not reading the data, apparently. So now we got to do some more testing. Who loves testing? Yay, debugging. Debugging is fun. All right, so that string, and we know that we wrote data to that string when we saved it, and that contains the same data, and see if it returns anything. And you can see that I have, oh, there's some data. Data one. Uh, 
Okay, so there's data there. So this isn't working right. So let's change it to a list count. Let's try elements instead of uh, elements. Number of delimiters is greater than one. Let's see if that returns anything. Still nothing. It's a bit odd. Okay. And what we could do is on our test line here, line, see if it's writing anything. Let's see if it's even triggering. And so, so that, that line's not even triggering. So we'll put that back up there. So the error, the error we're having is here. So number of delimiters is greater than zero. Let's see if that gives us anything. Still nothing. Ah, it's it's you know. Let me back it up a bit here. You know why it's not working? Because I haven't let it know. How can it tell me how many delimiters there are if I don't give it the delimiter? Duh. Duh. D lovely. There you go. Planets have their populations. Just as uh, well, we have that's, those. I think those are generated random numbers. So we need to continue to pull the right information. So now what we're going to do is set this to value. We're going to get element one. Copy that over. And then element two. And then element It's magic. This was based on, I don't know what seed value it was based on, but let's just put in 999 again. Generate. We know that this planet has 6,557 five, 6, population and zero uh, material type. I'm sure that that is consistent. It is. Now we can save. And we'll run it again. And what happened? Anyone want to guess what just happened? The population is right for this extra planet, but the planets from the previous seed are still there. Question as to why that happened. Well, I'm writing into the array the new spots. And in the array is still the previous data. So we have to clear the array first. That should solve that bug. Uh, generates, I don't know, there you go. Get this picture here, With that being uh, a population of 3,900. We save it, and we run it. I will write over it, save it, run it. So any questions so far? There was one that was uh, from, from GGDA once again. Uh, he says, nice planet characteristics. So how about an economy generator based on how far away the planets are from each other? Oh, gee, yeah, sure. <laughs> All right, so do I need to read the oh, rest? Yeah, it, okay. Uh, for instance, if one planet sells dilithium and another sells uh, midichlorians, uh, they could each buy and sell for a default of you know, 100 GP lat uh, latinum. However, the further away the one gets from the other item source, the price goes up based on the XY difference between them. It seems kind of... All right, so, you know, yeah, what I love about programming is... Um, my experience working in the oil industry is you have people who don't program think up ideas. <laughs> <laughs> and, 
and they expect it to be the easiest thing in the world. And what I've found funny is that um, the things that you expect to be easy end up being the hardest. And things like uh, Andrew just suggested, which, you know, off the top of your head, while that seems pretty complicated, end up being pretty easy. So I'm going to hold my tongue and, and say that that's not something we can't do. I think we're going to do it. We're going to try to do it 15 minutes. First wow. thing he said is distance. Um, a, an object that will calculate distance. So we'll use the advanced direction object. Okay. You get two objects to do distance with. So this one we will call click one. Our object we call click two. And Fusion is going to automatically number it for me. Fusion is just so friendly. I love it. Okay. Now we need, we're going to repurpose our test list into our, our items list. And we uh, got. Uh, uh, Schmeg. We've got, uh, uh, let's see, uh, Green, Berg, okay. <laughs> element very popular in the universe called Miller Time. <laughs> Gotta have it. All right. And then, uh, how, how many uh, product types did we say we had? All right, uh, it's, it's got to match. We're going to have the same amount of as we do. Anyone remember how many item types we, we were making? Let's see. Generate planet type, and then down here. So material type was four, zero to four, which would give us zero, one, two, three. That's four material types. We've got four material types. Oh, man, I can't believe I just did that. There you go. Four material types. Great. What we're going to do now is we're going to build our clicking system. And we're going to say click on planets for comparison. Okay. I'm going to grab my favorite object of all time. Irritates people all the time when I do this, but this is my local value storage object. Go ahead, laugh. That's fine. I drop that bad boy down here. <laughs> Variable, which is click step through. All right? And we're going to say if. The user clicks on an object, to be one of the planets. Position, click one on the planet. One, to step through. So far, is that fair? Miller, is that fair? Is everything I've done up to this point fair? I would call fair, yes. I'm trying to sound like uh, um, a Chris Angel. A magician. Ah. All right, dude. All right. So, now the reason why I didn't put... The reason why I did these recursively is if I put this event above here, when I click on the object and it's zero, I add one to zero, I'm still clicking on an object, it would treat this one as a trigger too. But by recursively placing them in order so that they're kind of backwards, it erases at the bottom of the main loop that I click on. Does that make sense? So that when I go back, the next object I click on is a new click. So let's uh, do one thing real quick. Our selectors so we know that we're selecting different. Blue, now let's go with... Uh, orange and the brighter orange because I don't believe we used orange in any of the planets and then we got to make sure that they are always on top top and then so now we've identified two planets that we want to compare now we have to uh, figure out what so I'm going to grab two new string objects. 
blown these three times. Well, we'll just do two because I don't need the test one right now. Is we're going to click on that planet. We're going to say position, select position, near to the planet, right? And then we're going to change the optimal strain to the line relative to. And then we're going to do actually that here and then this one here. Have I done it right? We should get the different product types. And let's see, this one, because I got rid of my test string, I can't tell which is which. We need a test string again, it looks like. Um, um, here. Okay, and uh, always for our test string, change ultra string, string, and it's, uh, we just need the material type right now. Okay. Good. Then I think here I'd like to offset it a little bit. We'll, we'll do it like this. And we duplicate that down here. Identify which one we're doing. So it's mouse over planets. And this has got a material type of one. This has a material type of one. Click on this one. It's Miller time. And if I click on, didn't bring the product over. So that's interesting. Could be because it's zero based. If this one is three, yeah, see, when this is zero, okay, so what happened there is that we have a, a one based versus a zero based. So the material type is zero based, but the list is one based. So I need to change the offset. And one. So then be Miller time anymore, it should be Kistagurium, which it is. So now we have, we've identified what products are on each planet. And then because we're running short on time, because this bad boy for clip step through. And uh, we need to figure out the distance. So we could just real quick say string, give me and we use that distance object here. So we're going to go no decimals. We grab the x, y points of the two. OK. It's a step two see that these two far apart they are because I got the wrong click step it should be two so 63 parts sets apart so if I wanted to transact between Kisselgurium and Greenbergathium uh, they have 263 parsecs to traverse which we can use our calculation the other thing we'd have to do is identify in another list values. I haven't really mu written much on exchange rates, so I guess we could start with a value for each 10, 20, 30, 40. Got our values there. And we could say that the first person is trying to sell gas. I don't know how we would do the, I'm not good with my economic formulas, but. We did do it that way. A plus R6 A it costs uh, we can sell right, we can sell we'll say string 
plus four. And we'll stop there as we gotta do another step. To the step, I don't have an isolated uh, object. Now what I could do, insert collision overlapping. I have isolated down to one planet that I can pull numbers from, which means I can go into here. Plus, and then I could say we need to get uh, value get line based on material type and we could say more right so we could say divided by then we got our distance calculation here and we're going to get a bad number, but it'll be a number nonetheless. Another 63 parsecs, we can sell it for zero, and that's because these values divided by the distance don't equal a proper positive number. So we just stop a bunch of zeros in front of these for right now. Still nothing, so there's something wrong with my formula. Fine. Probably because I should divide the distance. At. There you go. 515 measurement. Uh, Mr. Miller, what's our unit of our, our monetary measurement here out here? There? Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. What is our? What are we calling it? Not gold. Yeah, we gotta have money for this universe we're not creating. Not gold. Not gold. Not gold. I don't know. Um, my solar noids. Okay, solar noids. <laughs> rich on them solar noids. So it's, it's not exactly what Andrew asked for, but we did calculate distance. And we did find out what product I have and how much it would cost for me to sell it here. Now you could go further and figure out what the cost of the materials are here, do an offset. There's all sorts of things you can do, but once you have the distance measurement and the ability to isolate the two planets, it's really easy to do. So I hope that answers, answers Andrew's question. We got it done. We got it done in an hour. I, I, uh, I'm floored. Basic procedural generation. Wow. I am I am absolutely floored, dude. This is amazing. <laughs> well, let's, let's see if anybody has any comments. Yeah, yeah, well, the... uh, no comments as of now. Uh, we've been having some uh, viewers pop in and out throughout the night, but I got to tell you, this is... Uh, this is some uh, YouTube gold, especially uh, you know for future viewers who couldn't make the actual stream tonight. So, okay. uh, I mean, wow, dude! Uh, virtual high five from Georgia to California. Um, high five! <laughs> this, I like. Uh, yeah, this was absolutely amazing. Um, let's see, what am I doing here? I am going to quickly go through uh, just our quick little a few announcements. One of the things that I forgot to mention at the beginning of the stream. Um, so everybody can see my ugly head. Here we go. Uh, that. Yes. Hi. There's. <laughs> all right. Um, something we forgot to mention at the beginning of the. Um, but you did show a couple of things. Fusion Wars Game Jam. Chris, you want to talk a little bit about it? I'm going to throw a link right here. Sure. Oh, thank you. So uh, we're going to do another uh, Game Jam this uh, December, and uh, we're calling it Fusion Wars: The Programming Menace. Game Jam. And uh, basically, as traditional programming threatens to quash creativity in the galaxy, Fusion must come to the aid of developers and give the power of programming back to everyone. Game Jam far, far away, but let's be honest, it's just at your desk. And help us save the galaxy by building an awesome game in two weeks using Click Game Fusion and win some awesome prizes that we'll announce soon along the way to the script side. <laughs> 
<laughs> hey, all right. So, hey, uh, explain your image there. You got to explain that one because you, you told me oh, a little yeah. bit so, about it. So, but... it is, uh, you know, what was Darth Maul is now Nico, who's our artist. Uh, and, of course, he wears glasses. So, this handsome young fellow here is our founder, Eves. And if you grab the poster from uh, the original Star Wars, that's a totally different face. I got to give Nico super credit. I looked at it the first time and I'm like, did you change the poster? And then you look at it and you're like, oh yeah, holy smokes, he did. Uh, this is uh, uh, Oliver, uh, one, another one of our artists. And if you look closely at this, that is not uh, Obi-Wan, that's uh, Danny. And uh, you look closely at this, that is not Padme, that is my daughter, Taylor. And of course, this isn't a spaceship, this is Eves' Renault. So there you go, that's our uh, parody poster about the contest um, yeah check it out another thing that would be great for you to check out is I stream every Friday Reactor. the reactor is like a membership service for click team users where you get uh, awesome free stuff out of the store every uh, um, month a ton of uh, free examples like the one I just made uh, is posted exclusively just for those users and uh, we stream every Friday and all the content I made is uh, is user generated, so you tell me what you want, and I make it for you. Just uh, uh, two weeks ago, and I did an inventory system last Friday. So I'll put that link there. Any support you can give is welcome. And who knows? Maybe you'll learn some some more cool stuff. And uh, if uh, anybody's interested in picking up a copy of Fusion, uh, they can contact Mr. Miller, and he can. Uh, Get you hooked up through me with uh, fifty percent off. Ooh, how about that? I have 50% a offer, and uh, yeah, to you. All right, all right. Well, thank you so much for your uh, workshop tonight, man. This was this was awesome. So, all right, moving right along. I'm gonna run through these quick little uh, announcements. Um, if you're tuned in here, stay tuned because shortly, right after we finish this stream. Uh, Andrew is going to be playing his game, uh, Faden Sun's Noble Armada, which was also made in Fusion. That's right. You see, we got good thumbs up, and we also are looking at one of the developers right there, <laughs> Chris Carson, rocking and rolling. Uh, so stay tuned right here on this Mixer channel with Andrew as he playtests Fading Sun's Noble Armada. Um, and then, uh, all right, here we go with my announcements. The Georgia Game Developers Association, what you're watching here today. The GGDA is a nonprofit organization. Um, then our focus is on educational gaming and uh, teaching you more about game development. So support our Patreon as well. Uh, your support will help us with efforts to improve game developers and their community, as well as helping to bring better games to life. And our stream is for ga uh, gamers looking to learn more about what goes into making games, as you learned here tonight. Uh, it's also for new designers looking to break into the industry, and it's also for experienced designers looking to improve their skills. And certain levels of our Patreon members get to join our live stream vocal chat, uh, as we had Andrew here a little while ago, not sure where he went. Uh, he better come back soon, <laughs> right? So anyways, ah, here we go, the GGDA Patreon link. There you go. Uh, coming up next, you uh, see this awesome looking GGDA shirt. Uh, promise you the shirt will give you more HP and stamina. The coffee cups will give you more intellect. I promise it does work. So go to our cafe press and buy something. And buy I'm right behind Brian's shoulder. <laughs> what? Ah, okay. No, he's not really there. I'm just hearing voices in my head. Okay, sorry. Uh, moving right along. Hey, uh, as I mentioned earlier, if you check out our YouTube channel, um, all of these videos that we do stream, we permanently keep up on our YouTube. So go check out and be sure to follow our YouTube channel and our Mixer channel to stay tuned in everything that we do. And what else did I have? The ah, the Georgia Game Developers Holiday Party. That's right. We're all of us Georgia game developers get together and have a shindig on December twelfth at Tripwire Tripwire Interactive's new offices. Uh, if you're familiar with Tripwire, we're talking about, God, Tripwire, not Twipwire. Uh, we're talking about, uh, you know, Killing Floor, Killing Floor 2, uh, right? God, you got to know these games. Uh, we're going to be partying at their new offices, so come join us for fellowship, fun, and festive Zed slaying. 
And also, as I mentioned, if you're into games, you're interested in game development, be sure to follow this channel here, um, uh, mixer.com forward slash GGDA, and also our YouTube channel. Again, thank you so much, Chris, for tonight's stream. That was awesome. Can't wait uh, to see how it results. And also, can't wait to see Fading Suns Noble Armana. So, uh, Andrew, you ready to take over? Sounds the lovely. Sounds the lovely. All right. Good night, everybody.